Big hand to Jesse Gurr. Thank you. I always like to include pictures of my team and my family in my slides because this is the reason that I'm doing this. This is the reason that I travel. This is the reason that I talk. Um, I'm super passionate about growing businesses. I'm super passionate about helping other people grow businesses and allowing yourself to free up some time in your life. Um, so this is my team. Uh, we, I, I run a website development agency out of uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, we have nine people, website developers, project manager on staff, um, a, a full-time support agent, um, and a content writer in-house. And my, my kids, uh, Cedar is my six-year-old and River is my four-year-old. They are very typical six and four-year-old boys and they keep me on my feet. I enjoy traveling with them. Um, Cedar will be at a word camp in just a few years. I'm, I'm pretty sure he's, he's interested in following in, in the WordPress uh, footsteps that I've been working on. So my talk, project management for developers. The reason that I put this together uh, is because I started my business back in 2005 as just me, solopreneur. I was the website designer, I was the website developer, and I was also the person answering all of the phone calls. And as my business grew, the first people that I started to hire were in production. So I started hiring more web designers. And we ended up in a unique situation. And I don't know, this, this may sound familiar to some of you, possibly, but I would have my web developers or myself get on the phone and talk directly to the customer about what they were looking for. And the customer would say, hey, I need a seven page website. And the web designer would say, oh, that's great. Okay, pretty simple, seven pages. So, you know, we get them a quote for their seven page website, sign on the dotted line, and as soon as the project starts, customer gets back on phone with the designer and says, hey, I, I actually forgot, I've got three more services, I think we should highlight those all out. Is that gonna be a problem? So as a web designer, it's not too hard, especially if you're using WordPress to just add three more pages, slap some content up there, great, good to go. All right, customer, your seven page website has now turned into a 10 page website, but it wasn't a lot of extra time. We'll let it slide. How does it look? And inevitably the customer says, oh, that's right, I've got four employees. Wouldn't it be cool if they all had their bios on our website? Maybe we could have a fancy team page where the photos flipped when you uh, scrolled over them. And by this point, you know, you just want your customer to be super happy. And again, you know, it's just a, super, a simple team uh, plugin and you type up a couple of bios, you put their pictures up on the website and the next thing you know, you're just about to launch the site when your customer says, hey, you know that contact form, wouldn't it be really sweet if people filling out that form could determine or could tell me if they're a customer? or if they have a new sales inquiry. And wouldn't it be cool if they were already a customer, the fields changed so they could fill out their name and their website that they already have with me and other information. But if they were maybe uh, an inquiry and wanted to buy from me, they could change, uh, they could fill out uh, different fields based on the products and services that were, they were interested in. And so, all right, we're already using Gravity Forms. Pretty easy to set up conditional logic, not a problem. Let's just go ahead and build that into your contact page. And now we're pretty much done with your site, but wait! The day before launch, your customer signs up for a live chat service because they saw it on another website. And wouldn't it be nifty if everyone visiting their website could contact them through a little chat box? And so this is super easy. You guys have all done this before, right? You just get the JavaScript code from your customer, put it in the header, and it works right away, right? <laughs> super simple. No, no, but, but again, you know, the designer wants to make the customer happy at any expense and so they're gonna, they're gonna go ahead and they're gonna fight with this JavaScript, they're gonna put it in the wrong place in the header, they're gonna find out it needs to be in the footer, then they're gonna find out it has to go back in the header and they're gonna have to make custom buttons and custom graphics and then the website's ready to go live. Oh, but wait, what if we just put a contact form in the footer? Just three fields, simple, simple, easy. Then we're done, I promise, I promise, right? So what's happened here? What's happened here is that you've sold your customer a seven page website and what they got was a whole lot of stuff they didn't pay you to do. Anybody familiar with this? Has this happened to anybody? Couple people in the room. All right, so I like to get a feel um, 
for who I'm, I'm, I'm kind of delivering the talk to and hopefully you know, some Q&A time we can have a little bit of back and forth, talk about your specific struggles. How many of you are working as website designers? How many of you are freelancing? How many of you work for an agency? How many people are the sole contact for most of the customers that come into your business? All right, so that's a pretty good, pretty good spread here. Um, so as web designers, we like to focus on what we're building and not so much on managing what we're building. We really like to get the work done. We like to make our customers happy, but we need to be sure that along the way we are keeping things in bounds so that the project isn't spiraling out of control as in the example that I showed. Um, so I'm gonna give you just a very, very basic overview of what project management is uh, to start, and then we'll get a little bit deeper into scope creep and controlling uh, how your projects move forward and keeping things in line. So the first thing to understand about a project is a project is a temporary endeavor. Uh, it has a very set and defined beginning point, and it has a very set defined end point. So a project isn't a website that goes on and 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 continually gets added to, the project is the initial scope of work. There's a starting point and there's a clearly defined endpoint when the project is complete. And so projects have uh, three things that kind of make up the quality of, of how the project ends and that is the, the cost, how much you're gonna charge for your project, the time, how long it's gonna take you to complete the project, and the scope, which is the full list of all of the features, all of the things that you're going to do during this project. And all three of those things dictate the quality. Uh, this project management triangle we'll talk about a little bit further down the road. And so a manager, project management, a manager is the person who has the responsibility to make decisions about a project. The manager of a project is the person who is solely responsible for the success or for the failure of a project. So as the project manager, you are working with your customers one-on-one -on -one to control the cost of the project, to control the scope of the project, to control the time of the project so that you can end up with a successful project. Now a successful project might not just be a really great looking website, a successful project might be the relationship that you end your website build with your client on. So if you build a terrific website for your customer, but you're fighting so much during the process that the, at the end of the project, you guys have a sour relationship, that may very well be a failed project. And so what I'm gonna help you do today is learn how to keep your projects on track and work towards quality and success. Uh, so back to the project management triangle, this, uh, this is uh, kind of out of the Project Management Institute, sort of a very great way to look at how to, to keep the quality of your project under control. Um, so again, the quality is in the inside of the triangle and the quality of the project is going to be dictated by the time it takes you to complete, the cost, and the scope. And so the key is to keep the triangle equilateral. Anytime one thing gives, the other things have to give along with the thing that you changed so that the triangle doesn't get out of proportion. So here you see if we increase the scope of a project without increasing the cost or the time it takes the, to complete, the quality is going to suffer. So if you add to a project, you need to make sure that you are adding on the uh, appropriate amount of time and the appropriate cost. So for freelancers, kind of a very practical approach to project management, your job as a project manager is to make sure that your projects are completed on time. Your job is to make sure that they meet the agreed project scope that you talked about with your customer. And you need to make sure that your projects cost what you agreed to at the beginning of the project. And so you need to take a step out. So instead of going back to the example that I gave earlier with the web designer continually thinking, oh, that form is so easy to build, or oh, let's just add one more page because it's simple for me to do. When you're acting as a project manager, you need to take a step out of your web design shoes and stop thinking about how easy it is to add certain things to a website, but think about the time and the cost impl implications that those will have on the overall product. So your job as a project manager is to stop thinking like a web designer. You need to change your mind shift. 
As a project manager, you are the person who is going to keep your project leading. Uh, you're the one who's going to communicate with uh, all of the members that are involved in the project. Uh, you're going to balance competing objectives. Has anyone ever been in a room with a board of directors who's working together on a project? And you have five different people on the board and they all have different ideas. So your job for the project manager is to determine what is the goal? What is the initial outcome? How do we balance all of the different ideas that everybody's bringing to the table and agree on one decision to help move forward? Determine who the decision maker is in your board of directors. If you're working with four different people and you come together in a group meeting and they have a bunch of ideas, this is a great time to interject and say, hey, okay, I hear all of you. Let's summarize all of your ideas. Why don't the four of you meet as a team and decide which one of you is gonna be the decision maker on the project? Uh, so when you first start your projects, especially if you're working with multiple people, Make sure that you determine one person on the client end who is going to be delivering final decisions to you and who's gonna be in charge of making uh, the calls of what happens in the project. It's okay if they need to go back and consult with their board, but you don't need to be part of that process and you need to make sure that you are clear on who is allowed to give you changes so that you don't end up in a situation where four different people are requesting four different things and you're just bending and doing all of them or you could be adding on cost and cost and cost to compete with every single person's different ideas and at the end of the project you come back and nobody's clear who had the authority to continually increase the budget of this project. So make sure that when you're working with customers there's one clear decision maker. The other part of your job is communication. Actually the biggest part of a project manager's job is gonna be communication, making sure that everyone is crystal clear about how the project is flowing, how things are on track and also Make sure that you keep all of the different members who are working on the board of directors or on the team uh, you're building a website for focused on the central goal. What was the initial intent of the project? So some great skills to have. Problem solving is essential. Communication, like I said. Motivation. As a project manager, you need to be motivated to keep the project moving. Oftentimes, you may need to be a cheerleader for your customers. You may need to help them keep the project moving forward and let them know what the next steps are. Uh, leadership skills, absolutely important, especially if you're working with a team inside of your organization. But leadership skills with your work, when you're working with your customer are also going to come in so you can help guide your customer. You can show them what they need to provide to you. You can demonstrate how to keep the project moving forward smoothly. Uh, negotiation skills, you may have to get into a tough situation or a tough conversation with a customer where they want 10 team members added to their website, but you can't do that for free. So you might need to negotiate a cost and that's gonna obviously increase the time it takes you to complete the project as well. So you'll, you're gonna need to renegotiate the time frame that you talked about at the beginning of the project. Um, and customer service, Number one, uh, this is the, the biggest thing that we focus on in, in our company is making sure that every step of the way, no matter how firm you're being with customers and how much you're, you have to say no or you have to increase the price, do it with a smile. Make sure that you are answering your phone. Make sure that you're providing fast, responsive customer service. That is going to speak, speak dollar signs to your customer. They're going to be more willing to work with you on terms if you have great communication skills and great customer service to back it up. Uh, you may also play some other roles. You may be involved in accounting. Uh, if your customers call up and they want to know where we're sitting with billing, you may have to look up their account. You may have to tell them you know, how much money they owe. You might have to send out some invoices as the project manager. Uh, you very well could be acting as a sales agent. Uh, in the example where someone wants to add a team section on, you might have to upsell your customer. And that's a great thing. Don't be afraid to upsell as part of your project management. That's only more money for your business and for you. And you might be a hiring manager. If you are working with an internal team, maybe you need to bring on contractors. Maybe you need to bring on graphic designers. Maybe you need to bring on uh, content writers. Or perhaps to get your job done easier, you need to purchase a specific plugin. So part of your job as a project manager could be making executive decisions on what software gets purchased and what people you hand jobs over to to efficiently complete the job. Uh, you might yeah, the purchasing manager, you may need to buy software as well. All right, so this brings us to kind of the, the heart of the conversation. Uh, the talk in the other room at 9 o'clock was a little bit of, I mentioned a little bit about scope creep. Is everybody here familiar with the term scope creep? 
One person. One person. You want to explain what scope creep is? Well, <laughs> I, I'm an employee. I work in higher education. So scope creep is when my vice president comes up to me five times a day and asks for the extra features after we've decided on that seven-page website you described. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So scope creep is when a project starts to creep up beyond what you originally agreed to do. And you know that scope creep has already happened when it's starting to cost your business more time or more money than you originally budgeted. So the goal as the project manager, the primary overarching goal as a project manager is to mitigate scope creep. So we're gonna talk about some ways to do this. And first and foremost, scope creep prevention starts with the sale. So, another hypothetical situation. Let's say we've got a sales guy and we've got a customer and they have a really friendly meeting and they're talking about everything that the customer needs on her website. And so the sales agent leaves the conversation thinking, oh, you know what? She just needs a super simple brochure marketing site, a couple of little design features, maybe some contact forms. But the customer leaves that meeting thinking, ooh, I'm gonna get an e-commerce site, I'm gonna get conditional logic forms, I'm gonna get team bios, I'm gonna get all of these fancy features because he told me that their team was so good at making websites. And so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna end up with an amazing product. Uh, so sales agent goes back to the developer and says, hey developer, here's a project for you. This is a super simple website project. And the developer starts working, gets the website built, connects with the customer and finds out that no, what the developer delivered was not exactly what the customer was expecting because the customer was pretty sure the sales agent was clear about her shopping cart and about her team members and about the conditional logic forms. And now we have an issue where there is a complete disconnect, a complete misunderstanding, and this is where the quality suffers in the relationship. Uh, this is a great example of when that triangle becomes equilateral because the customer's expectations on scope were not the same as your expectations. And so we may have a really awesome looking website, but we now have a serious situation with our customer. And that I would, I would call a project fail. So, project management and scope creep prevention starts with the sale. When you are selling a project, if you have a team that does sales, make sure you're delivering a super crystal clear proposal. Make sure you're line iteming, line -iteming everything in your proposal. Uh, how many website pages are you gonna build out? Define what a website page is for you. So in our company, we say we're gonna build out 15 website pages. Oh. Yeah, we define a page as 750 words and two or three simply formatted photos. My favorite, one of my favorite graphics. Yeah. <laughs> you can have it good or fast, but it's not gonna be cheap. You can have it good and cheap, but it's not gonna be fast. <laughs> define, if you're, if you're building out contact forms, do they include conditional log logic? Be super specific in your proposals. Contact forms, if you just say we're gonna put a generic contact form on your page and you think that that's a six field form and your customer thinks it's an 80 page form, that's a, that's a big difference. So define what does contact form mean? Are you gonna give them six to 12 input fields? Are you gonna give them three conditional logic sections? Do each of those conditional logic sections have four input fields that change? Is it gonna be one page contact form or is it gonna be a multi-page contact form? Are you building out products? Is it an e-commerce website? In my experience, the larger the website, the more potential there is for scope creep and the more potential there is to lose money. And this is simply because as the project gets bigger and bigger, especially with e-commerce, it's, it's, it's not fun and it's not as easy to define the specific features that go into it. So if you're building e-commerce and part of your contract is that you're gonna build out products for your customers, define exactly how many products is included at your price point. Define what a product looks like. How many pictures are gonna go on a product? How many variables are gonna go? Do you sell t-shirts? Do we wanna do different colors of t-shirts? Do we wanna do different sizes of t-shirts? Does a large green cost the same amount as a small red? These are things that you need to spell out and then it's really great if you can in your proposal 
include a price per additional so that your customer knows and is, and is not surprised when you come to them and say, hey, said 50 products, but we're at 75. That's, that's 25 more than, than was included. And so you're looking at X for your additional spend on this. Is that okay? Now, I'm not saying you have to be 100% super rigid. It's always good to give a little bit. Just make sure that you're not giving so much that your customer, they have to go back and backpedal and fix the situation. So, you know, 50 products and they give you 51. There's, yeah, there's, there's reason to argue though that, that that's okay. And that's going to lend back to your customer service experience as a project manager, just using a little bit of common sense. Uh, explain your process. What we do in our business is we hold a project kickoff meeting as soon as the project closes, where our project manager, the sales guy, and the decision maker, very important to have the decision maker um, uh, on the customer end, uh, all get together. They, they talk about the whole project, they review the proposal, and they talk about how they like to communicate. Some people like phone calls, some people like emails, some people like text messages. Uh, make sure when you have your project kickoff meeting that you're all on the same page about scope of work, about communications and set expectations. If your customer owes you 10 pages of content before you get started, put a deadline on that. Tell them when you need it by. Explain to them that you cannot con uh, continue with your process until you have deliverables from them. Likewise, set expectations for yourself. Let them know how frequently you're going to be delivering. Let them know how they should expect to hear from you. Let them know when you're gonna get updates and let them know what your billing schedule looks like so that everybody's crystal clear from the beginning how your process works and how the project will move forward. Identify milestones. So when we start a new project, typically what we give our customers is a timeline, which is an overarching sheet of what their entire project looks like. And it starts with the project kickoff meeting. We have the date on there and then we have a place for them to initial off at the end of the meeting. Um, following that, we need content. And so that's uh, one of the milestones and we will put a date that it's due by. The, the timeline can, be, can change as it goes. Uh, you can you know, set the date for the next deliverable and then put expectations for how long it'll take you to turn around after you receive from your customer. What order do things need to be completed in? If you need content before you can build out a website design, make sure that your customer sees that. Have it in print, have it on a PDF, have it on a website somewhere so they can visually see the order that their project's going to be completed in. This will help them stay on track and this will also help you stay on track and organize your projects so that you can see as you go down the timeline where you're falling at. Also stick to your timeline. Once a customer signs off on something on their timeline, they don't get to go back and make changes. If they go back and make changes, that's a change of scope. That's a change of your project. That should fall under billable time. Back to communication. Your most important job as a project manager, make sure you're keeping those lines of communication open. Find out, I said this earlier, who the primary contact is. Find out who the decision maker is. And most importantly, make sure you're keeping a record of all communications you have. It's very easy to get on the phone with a customer or meet with someone face to face and have a long conversation about what they're expecting and what you're going to do and then go back and do it only to find out that information was taken a different way from the customer. So after an in-person meeting, after a phone call, always send a follow-up email outlining what you talked about outlining the scope of work, outlining the price, the time it's going to take. This way, you're all on the same page before you start, and if anything changes moving forward or expectations change, you have written documentation to refer to. Also, make sure that different team members are not promising different things to the same customer. Uh, we have run into this situation before where a sales guy gets on the phone with a customer and says, oh yeah, we'll go ahead and do that for you. And then the project manager is on the phone and says, oh yeah, we're gonna do it this way. And then they get the developer on the phone and the developer says, oh, actually we're gonna do it this way. And now we've got a customer who's been told three different things by three different people. Now that's cool. If you wanna have your developers talk directly with your customers, that can, that can be super advantageous. Sometimes it's really hard to get across an idea or to explain a concept as a project manager. Maybe you just need your tech officer to do it. If that happens, again, make sure that written communication is followed up. Make sure that you are sending an email or that your developer is sending an email and copy the project manager, copy the customer on that email. Hey, great phone call. This is what was said. This is how we're moved forward. This is how it's gonna uh, affect your project. And address red flags super quickly. If, if your project starts 
to get into scope creep, if, you, if your customer starts expecting more, make sure that you nip it in the bud as soon as you possibly can. This will set expectations moving forward. Um, if you make it clear to your customer right away when something goes out of scope, they'll be less likely to continually pile on things that are out of scope as the project moves forward. And they'll know how you react to it. They'll be able to kind of gauge moving forward how the project's going to change with their expectations. Revisit the original goal. So many times we've been halfway through a project when the customer says, oh, we should start selling. Well, what was the original goal of your project? You wanted to get more phone calls. Yeah, but maybe we should just sell our products online. Well, let's take a step back here. How do you sell? What's your best sales method? You, you told us at the beginning of the project that phone calls was the original goal. So always go back to that. If you're having an issue with scope creep, always pull out the original goal of the project. Why were we doing this in the first place? Is what you're going to do, or is what you're wanting to add on going to accomplish your goal? Is it going to make things muddy? Can we add it later? If we add on e-commerce to your website, how's that gonna affect your deadline? You have a really big trade show coming up in two months. You wanted to get your new website up before your trade show. If we add on e-commerce, are we gonna meet that deadline? And keep track of scope changes. Uh, we have a change order form that's on our website that people fill out. Um, depending on the change order request, there may be a cost associated with it, which we make them pay at the time that they fill out the form. So if your customer does want to add their team bios onto the website, that's great. Don't be afraid to upsell, but make sure you're recording it and make sure that they're signing off on it. And if it is gonna incur additional costs, make sure that either they put a deposit toward that or somewhere signed to agree that they will meet the additional cost. If it's going to delay the launch of the project, make sure that, they're clear, that you're clear about that and that they understand and that they accept those terms. So maybe adding on three more pages isn't going to change the cost, but maybe it's gonna push launch date back a week. Is that okay? Does your customer agree to those terms? And finally, when a project is complete, follow up. Ask questions, get genuine feedback. It is so much easier to get feedback from your customers and get reviews as soon as a project is done than it is to come back and two, two or three months later. Uh, ask how you did. How did this project flow for you? What could I have done better? What expectations did you have that weren't met? Did I go above and beyond anywhere? Getting feedback from your customers will help you move forward, will help you better your process, will help you change how you handle your project management. All right, so any questions so far? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about tools. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for uh, phone time. Phone time? Yeah. Do we bill for phone time? Right. So typically we, so the question was, do we bill for phone time? Um, no, unless it falls into consulting time about something that wasn't originally included. So when we put together proposals, if it's an active client that we're working with, we typically include project management time in the cost. So we average, you know, the average project that takes us a month to complete is going to take 20 hours of project management time, for example. Project management time is going to include those phone calls. Project management time is going to include organizing collecting information, emailing back and forth. Um, if you set your proposal structure up correctly, um, oftentimes when we're doing custom builds, we will include a one hour consultation with a designer, or we will include a 45 minute review with the project manager on the phone. Um, and so for the larger projects, we oftentimes will dictate how much time is included. And then above that, if it, it, if it really gets out of control, then yeah, we'll, we'll let them know, you know what? We've gone an hour past the time that was allotted. At this point, we're falling into consulting time. Um, if it's on new add-ons, you can handle that either by saying, you know what, this, is, this may fall into a phase two. This may be something that we consult about later, or you, you may send them back to sales. And then however you handle your sales process um, and billing for that. Does that answer your question? Yes. OK. Yes. Um, how do you bill? Do you only bill by project, or do you bill hourly, or is part of you know, project and then hourly when you get into additional stuff? Yeah, so the question is how do you bill by project or hourly? So we typically have, well we put out a proposal with a minimum scope of work. And the cost on that is a, pro is a per project. 
invoice um, for, for a new project, for example, for a full new development project. Um, and that price will spell out things like how much project management time and one-on-one -on -one communication time they get. It'll spell out you know, how many design revisions they get. It will spell out development features. Um, and then anything above and beyond that either falls into hourly if it's minor updates or changes, or it will be rolled over into another project. And so the way that we typically gauge it is if it's gonna take us less than three or four hours to complete, we will just invoice hourly for making additional changes and going above and beyond. We'll have them fill out a change order form for additional hourly work, and then they'll agree to the hourly cost, and oftentimes that change our order will say not to exceed four hours of additional work. But if it's going to take more time and it's gonna severely impact the timeline of the project, we'll oftentimes fill it out as a new add-on proposal. And at that point then, yes, it's project-based. So I guess the answer is it really depends on, on, on what, what exactly the add-on is. But, but initially, a project is always unique project. Initially, yes. We don't invoice hourly because it's very, very hard to calculate everything that goes into a project on an hourly basis um, because we're also accounting for overhead. I mean, we have an office, we have computers, we have an electric bill. We have the sales time that went into selling. It's, you know, so did it take a month to close a sale? Did it take two months to close a sale? So we look at all of those factors while we're determining a project price. Oftentimes, uh, the project price can be depended, um, can be reflected by a skill level. You know, so a very simple five page marketing website, even if it takes our developers less time to complete a five page membership website, the skill level there is quite a bit higher. Um, and so you need to kind of consider in a lot of different factors when you're, when you're pricing on projects. Um, hourly, you know, you, you can sit down and straight calculate out how many hours it's gonna take and I would recommend that you do that because it will give you a good idea of how long it's taking you to complete projects and how much you're actually making per hour, but you also need to cal calculate how much you actually need to make per hour to keep the business running. So there's a lot that goes into it. Um, yeah. Yes, yes. Well, uh, I missed five and six. Um, let's see what it was. Okay. So revisit the original goal. Ask why. Why did we decide to do this? Back to numbers five and six. And then step six was, six was scope changes. So for this, we have a change order form. Yeah. Yes. I came in late. Do you have copies of the I do, and it'll be at the end. Yes, the link to the slides will be at the end. And then one other thing. Do you have any samples for us? <sighs> hmm. That are relative to like web design? Potentially. See me afterwards. We might be able to. I might be able to show you a few things. Yeah, possibly. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about tools, um, but because you all are WordPress users and you might be web designers or web developers, I would encourage you to use the tools that you have at hand already. Um, change orders, we use Gravity Forms for change orders. There is a signature implementation that you can add on to Gravity Forms. You can add payment onto Gravity Forms. And it looks super professional when you send your customers to a page on your website with their change order spelled out and their price there and they can just sign online. It's also going to add value to your business and it's gonna validate you as a web designer if you're utilizing the tools that you have at hand. Uh, for timelines, uh, we utilize page builders. Great way, if you, if you use even Gutenberg blocks, maybe you have a timeline block and you duplicate that block over and over and over and over and you put every milestone along the way so your customers can see a visual. We actually have an entire website dedicated to project management and sales where we home all of this stuff so it's not indexed um, so people can reference it and we deliver our proposals. We deliver scopes of work uh, via the web as well. Super easy to create a page in WordPress, type up your proposal, type up your scope of work, embed a gravity form at the bottom of it, have your customers sign off on the scope of work. Uh, so one of the advantages that we have as website developers is we have access to these tools and we know how to use these tools so don't be afraid to use the tools that you're using for your customers for your own business to help you with your project management. What about finance and um, 
like a fresh books or something like that? Yeah, so there's a lot of different, uh, in terms of managing your financials, um, there are a lot, yeah, Harvest, fresh books, there are a lot of different invoicing software that you can use. Um, whether or not, you know, that's, that goes along with project management, I would, I guess I would recommend using a tool that you already have rather than uh, creating it from the ground up. But the reason why I ask is that, for example, yeah, I'm not I'm a small scale developer. So mm -hmm. um, if you're billing people by hours, or if you're tracking your time, how much time it consumes you or your small uh, workforce to work on a project, it's a way of tracking your project time. So there's a direct correlation between yes. the hours that they spend and what their costs are and so forth. Yeah, so the comment was that it's really great if you're charging hourly to be able to track all of your time. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of third-party uh, applications that do time tracking, that uh, integrate time tracking with task management. I'm gonna talk a little bit. I have just a few different tools that I've used in the past specifically for project management. Um, so if anyone's uh, heard of Zapier, uh, which allows different programs to be super integrated with each other. So there are a lot of time tracking. Harvest, I think, is one time tracking option that will integrate with Slack, that will integrate with Asana or Basecamp. So if you use any tools for project management and you want to bring time tracking into that or you want to bring billing into that, uh, you can, using APIs through Zapier, connect your different tools to work together. Um, so we have used all of these in the past, uh, Asana is a great task management software platform. Uh, if you like to make lists, if you like to check things off your list, Asana is great. Um, I have an overview here. Uh, when we used Asana in the past, we would create a template for the flow of a project and the steps that go along every section, uh, every way through the project. And you can just duplicate that template and modify it for every customer you take on. Uh, for website, go live checklists, get the DNS information, uh, do a page speed check, change the A record, check for broken links, all of the things that you do in your go live process. That's a great, Asana is a great tool to use to duplicate that um, and check off things as you go so you don't miss something. Uh, Trello is uh, very similar to Asana, but it's more board based where you can have different projects. It gives you sort of an at a glance view of all of the different projects that you're working on. The nice thing with Asana and Trello is if you want to, you can give your customers permission to access their project so they can see where you are in the workflow. Um, another project management tool similar is Basecamp. Uh, Basecamp used to be super popular in the tech industry. There are quite a few other alternatives now. Um, so depending on you know what what level your company's at, Asana has a free version for up to I think eight users and a certain number of projects. Uh, Trello and Basecamp are paid software project management tools. Slack is free for up to a certain number of users. We use Slack every day, even though we work together in a co-located office. Most of our communication is on Slack, just so that there's written communication. Um, we use Slack to post uh, updates about every project. So we have a different channel in Slack for every project that we're working on and the full proposal goes up in there. Um, recap of conversations on the phone with a customer goes in there so that the developers are on the same page as the project manager. Uh, more than anything, we use Google Drive and do Google Docs for project management. Uh, Timesheet or timelines, uh, change orders, proposals, those types of things. If you decide not to use your website in Gravity Forms or uh, page builders to, to build out some of these things. You can use Google Sheets. Uh, the nice thing about Google Drive is you can create shared folders for your customers to upload their photos, their logos, their assets. Uh, you can put notes in there for your customers as well. Uh, we will utilize Google Docs very frequently when we're working on website edits and changes so we can have multiple people working through the changes and crossing them out or highlighting the changes in different colors that they're going to work on so that our entire team is kind of on the same page about who's handling what. And yeah, that's kind of what I have. We have about five minutes for questions. And my slides, as someone asked for, is at icebergwebdesign.com slash WCSCV. Any further questions? Yes. How worried are you about um, different tools like Asana or, or the, the other ones, even Google, um, harvesting the information that you set up? So the question is, how worried are you about uh, some of these tools harvesting the information that you put up? 
Um, I guess my answer is a little bit. I would recommend that you never put sensitive data, such as passwords, into your uh, project management tools. However, we're not, we're not typically working with super sensitive data in these tools. I mean, a lot of it is you know, content that's going on a marketing page. If a customer has an NDA that we need to sign for something, we likely wouldn't publish that in one of these channels, um, depending on you know, what, the, what, what exactly it is. If it's financial information, um, payments information, anything like that, you, yeah, you definitely don't want to be publishing credit card numbers in project management tools. Uh, you'll you want to use different methods to communicate those. Lost pass, one pass. Um, one pass is a great service where you can just share your pa share passwords with your customers without actually getting their passwords um, so it encrypts it uh, you can use virtual private networks if you want to um, if you're on open Wi-Fi so if you're working in a coffee shop and you're concerned about it there are a number of VPN apps that you can install on your computer or your phone to encrypt data that passes through the Wi-Fi yes in the back Great comment. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, I've been uh, so I've been running my own uh, company for quite some time now, about um, four years. But I've been struggling really hard uh, to actually to actually be able to bill um, at a fixed price. It's, I've always shot myself in the foot every single time. <laughs> And uh, I mean, of course, like you know, the, even though the amount is growing, it's growing, but I'm still struggling. Like everything that you mentioned was like, I'm doing everything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I am in the right place right now. As you hear, you hear it talk. Um, it's so hard. It's it's um, so. Meanwhile, I'm like, uh, I started to uh, freelance again, and doing you know, I'm doing hourly, and I feel so much better. Like I'm just getting paid for what I what I feel I'm worth, uh, but yet like. Uh, I want to be able to get to the point where I can actually like sell uh, like websites, web applications to clients, and you know deliver uh, everything um, to the point where it's like clients happy. I'm happy. I'm making money. You know, everyone's making money. You know, right? But um, it's such just, just a struggle. I'm I'm just like I'm like doing both. I'm freelancing and running a company because I just haven't gone you know gone into the point where I could feel good and you know get it get up and running you know and, um, I guess maybe the question is um, like like how how can you securely uh, start with say a small whether it's yourself or maybe a small team kind of growing from zero to you know to where you are um, mm -hmm. how do we transition from basically like the hourly thinking but also uh, using um, a certain like certain uh, uh, like methods to actually uh, get out of that like that hourly zone and that um, uh, and terrible fixed rates right so for the video the, the comment was on on the struggle going from hourly rates to fixed rates especially as your team is growing and how to kind of overcome as you're growing your team charging on an hourly basis to charging on a per project base and how to increase that over time um, so I, I I have a whole talk uh, that I've delivered before on growing from a freelancer into an agency, um, and I'd love to chat with anybody about that. You know, outside of outside of this room later at the conference, if you're interested in that. Um, I mean, the short answer is, as soon as I started hiring people, I doubled prices, and then a couple of years later, you know, we did it again. Um, what you need to look at when you're setting your project price, a little bit of competitive analysis is helpful. Um, and obviously location is going to depend greatly on you know what you're going to charge but look at your whole overhead how much money do you want to make how much money are you putting into your office how much money are you putting into your staffing how much insurance do you have and how many projects do you think you're going to sell this year and so from a very very broad broad overview if you think you can sell two projects a month and you need a hundred thousand dollars to live then that's a hundred thousand divided by 24 per project right 
as, a, as kind of a base minimum to gauge project pricing. Now, obviously, you know, if you think you're going to sell a bunch of really complex projects and a bunch of smaller projects, that kind of changes up the numbers. But take a step back from the hourly thinking and, and think of it on a broader sense of how much you need to keep your business running and to keep your life stable. And then as you grow, think about what does growth look like? How do you want to change your prices and your price structure so that you can then meet the demands of your growing staff, your growing operations, and hopefully an increased salary for you as well? Yes. Do you oh, we're up. Do you include any language in your original contract addressing the issue of uh, what the process is for adding to the scope? Yes. Um, last question here. I'll answer very quickly. The question was, do you include con language in your contract for addressing scope changes and scope inc increases? Yes, absolutely. Um, in my contract, in our contracts, it, it very clearly states that you've agreed to the scope of work that you've signed up to on your proposal. So customer signs a proposal, scope of work, and they sign a contract. And then it does outline the change order process. Um, we also have a project delay uh, fee and process that is also outlined in the contract. So yeah, you need to make sure that the parts of your process that you may get pushback on from customers are clearly outlined in your contracts. And that's a completely different subject, but. All right, I think we're out of time. I will be available and around for the rest of the weekend. So thank you all very much for attending.